Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you all here today for the first webinar in the series for 2024. I'm Pamela Forward, President and Founding Director of Whistleblowing Canada Research Society, and I'm joining you from Ottawa, and therefore would like to acknowledge that I am on the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. For those of you joining us for the first time, we are a nonprofit registered charity dedicated to advancing education on the whistleblowing phenomenon through research and sharing the knowledge publicly, and in the process, informing pub public policy dialogue and development. We're largely a volunteer organization, and so we do thank those of you who have donated for this webinar. Your support is much appreciated. And now to the topic for today, and what a wonderful coincidence that we're going to talk about the politics of unity on this particular day, Valentine's Day, a day dedicated to love and presumably unity especially when there is so much of the opposite around us. So I, I know that you're all anxious to hear from our speaker, Marianne Cirilli, on the subject. Uh, and so uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our moderator, Dr. Jennifer Fraser. Jennifer is a member of our board of directors. She is a whistleblower herself and has written a book very relevant for whistleblowers called The Bullied Brain, Heal Your Scars and Restore Your Health. The Bullied Brain is also the name of her consulting firm. So over to you, Jennifer. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome. I am really excited to hear the talk today as I'm sure you are as well. Um, Marianne is a change agent. She works in um, politics and leadership. She began in health and is very engaged in leading youth and fitness. She was a three-term member of the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba from 1990 to 2003. And uh, she brings a wealth of knowledge and experience and expertise to teaching now at university and at college. She runs an organization that is Community de Development for Health and Sustainability and for Peace. Today, she's talking as Pamela introduced on the unity of politics or the politics of unity and how important that is. And um, I just a little housekeeping things. Marianne is gonna talk until about um, for around 45 minutes and then around quarter two, we will open up the floor so that there's lots of questions. I know she's built into her presentation questions to you because she loves that kind of collaborative dialogue. Um, you did notice that the session is being recorded. And um, if you have any um, concerns about technology, please consult direct message through the chat with Stephanie and she will help you. And um, if you want to ask questions, um, you can use the icon or you can put your hand up and I'll try and keep track of who um, would like to pose questions. Um, and also um, we ask that you don't have discussions or share information in the chat just because it's distracting. Um, but Marianne has very generously said that she will, um, if there's pressing questions or things you wanna share with her, she will uh, respond to emails after the talk. She may have time to stay a little bit after the talk as well. So um, we will ultimately use mm -hmm. the chat as our function for questions. And she will use the chat when she needs to in the presentation, but just Besides those very exact times, let's try and just stay focused on the talk, especially since it's being recorded as well. Okay, so without any further ado, um, please, Marianne, take the floor. Well, thank you so much, Pamela and Jennifer, for hosting this and for the introduction. Um, I am going to be sharing my screen with slides, and I'm, I'm probably also going to, at some points when we're having the discussion, close down the, the slideshow so that I can see you. And I would also ask when you are speaking, if you would share your video. I know a lot of times people, um, this is probably lunchtime for some of you, you may be eating, but if uh, if you don't mind, it's it's good to just be able to sh see people when, um, when, when they're speaking. So I'm going to go to my slide share and, and um, 
I apologize that I'm, uh, I wanted to use two monitors, but I'm not. So now when I'm on the slides, I'm not seeing you, which is unfortunate for today. But um, just to go do a bit of a, an overview of what I'm gonna be talking about today is we're going to start off by talking about power and we're going to then talk about this concept that I've developed called the politics of unity and the principles of the politics of unity. Um, and then we're going to talk about a couple of tools that I've developed. One is called power styles, and then this notion of collaborative governance, which is applying the politics of unity in governance structures and procedures. And then we'll have a little bit of a, of a, of a break for some uh, questions and discussion on those points uh, if we have time. And then we'll start talking about canceled culture and what I call complaint culture, which is kind of taking over a lot of workplaces and organizations. And we'll be talking about the difference between power struggles and conflict and conflict resolution. And then we're going to uh, have a bit of a look at this whole weaponization of procedure, which is part of, of this complaint culture where complaints, the process for complaints is being weaponized. And we're going to apply that to, to whistleblowing. So that, that sounds like a lot, and it is, <laughs> to try and cover in, in uh, 45 minutes. So this is where you get to use the chat. So I am going to um, stop the screen share, and I'm just going to get you to put a few words into the chat about how you define power or how you view power. So you can just put a few things in the chat so I can get a sense of where we're we're at with this group. So open up your chat, give some definition of power, how you see power. Ability to create change for collaboration. Oh, gold star. <laughs> okay, that's where we're going with this. Other people, hierarchy, change, uh, control. Yeah, controlling change. Others. Any others want to put in? Don't be shy. Okay, well, we'll go to the back to the slides because I'm suggesting that, uh, where's my slide share? That we are, we have a world right now where power is defined as force, as control, domination. It's very top down. It's zero sum, which means that if I'm going to have power, I have to take it away from somebody else because um, it's something that's a, a, a limited, it's in limited supply. And power is really about oppression, that it's about not just the threat of violence or punishment of some kind, but it's about marginalization. It's about, about um, using hierarchy and dominance uh, to exploit people, all those things that are part of oppression. And it's about controlling access to information, resources, decision-making and that. And we have a hierarchy of power that, you know, there's more power with people who have more um, privilege and uh, status and rank, and they have uh, access to uh, controlling resources and creating a sort of scarcity. So do, would you agree that that's, that's kind of the, the, the most common view of power? Would you agree with that? Yes, no, maybe, yes, okay. So um, the, what I'm suggesting is that we can, we can redefine power. All of this has only come from uh, the, the history of you know, patriarchy and, and the, the world that we've lived in. And uh, we can have a new definition of power, which is more about the power to collaborate, the power for solidarity and sharing. That power actually comes from empowerment and grows as it's shared. You know, that analogy of if I have a candle, I can light all the candles in the room and it doesn't diminish my, my, my candle. It, it's that's the idea of empowerment and sharing power and that there is a power in compassion and that's the antithesis of the power of oppression and that we can um, have people who are free to choose 
uh, how, you know, based on their values, how to behave. We don't have to have a society where there's the threat of punishment in order to try and get people to behave in a way that's community minded. A lot of us have a view that, um, you know, sharing power means that we have access to resources and that that is powerful when we're building coalitions, when we're working for social change, we're building social movements, there is a sharing of power in the movement and engaging people. And that's that's that power of, um, of inclusion. So this idea that we can change the structures from hierarchy and command and control to more networks of inclusion, and that there is there is enough power to go around, and that we're, if we do this new model of power, that that's actually really necessary to change the things that we that we want to change. Uh, well, having some challenges with my screen, my slides. There we go. Okay. So then I'm going to introduce this concept of the politics of unity because the politics that we have now, based on that definition of power, where power is seen as a a scarce resource that you have to control and and hoard is we have the politics of division. We have the politics of um, of you know divide and conquer. And the my premise is that we can have inclusion of people that are different without conformity. It means that you don't have to be the same in order to be included. You don't have to be the same race, the same gender, have the same views, but we can all be included. And so the premise of my work um, as a change agent is that we have to actually change the containers, the political and economic frameworks that are preventing change in order to address the issues that we're all facing, poverty, inequity, uh, climate change, war, you know, um, that, that our focus has to be on using social innovation to change governance structures that are actually protecting the status quo, protecting those power imbalances and um, preventing change. So, you know, a lot of my work is around participatory everything, participatory research, participatory budgets, participatory decision making. And it all starts with changing our own hearts and minds so that we're less reactive. And I'm a big fan of Paulo Freire, the Brazilian educator, that if a system doesn't allow dialogue, that the system has to change. So a lot of my work is about changing systems. I've gone from being a health educator that focused on health of individuals to focusing on the health of communities and organizations and systems and healthy cultures. So what is the politics of unity? It is applying a social innovation to politics, to changing the structures, the procedure, the culture of governance. So it's trauma-informed politics. It's in understanding how and why we are reactive and combative um, at, at the level of you know, small p politics in our personal lives, in our community organizations, but also big p politics, electoral politics. So it's understanding how do we develop our views of power? So I've created a tool that talks about the power styles we have but also how do we develop our power style? How do we develop our understanding of authority based on the way we're parented, school, media? And um, we also want to look at how we apply conflict resolution practices and principles to not just political relationships, but the structures and the procedures and the processes. So our, so our political institutions are less adversarial and you know, develop com combative kind of relationships. So I've created all sorts of tools for uh, participatory decision making, for engaging people in more participatory ways. Um, and uh, I think, again, that this is the basis for what we have to do. So the politics of unity so far has 40 principles um, that talk about redefining, you know, uh, a pro power as part of oppressive power. Um, and looks at how do we come to agreement rather than winning. So how do we create structures and procedures to go from trying to win to coming to agreement, going from debate to dialogue? And um, we're going to look at power styles in a minute. And I've developed this concept of speaking peace to power 
a lot of us have seen how we, you know, we talk about speaking truth to power, but even truth is being weaponized. So we need to figure out how do we disarm people that are abusing power, rather than thinking that if we just throw the truth at them, that we're going to be able to change their, their view. So I was fortunate enough to um, teach politics after being elected for 13 years. I taught a couple courses in women in politics, and I've taught courses in um, other, other courses in, in politics at the university and college. And I realized that a lot of students had no idea what is a political ide ideology, how are they different, how are political parties different. So I developed this idea that there are three Ps to politics that there's policy, which is really, you know, issues, tax cuts, uh, you know, um, climate, dealing with climate, human rights, all these different, we can have policy issues. But politics is also really about procedures and process. And are we going to be more engaging of people? Or are we going to be more autocratic? Are we going to be more participatory and democratic? And I actually see voting as in the middle and that voting is actually part of what creates winners and losers polarizing. And, um, you know, a lot of our electoral systems are all or nothing where you win or you, you know, you're completely um, you're completely uh, not the winner. And then this concept of power styles is how as people who are engaging in politics, whether that's in a boardroom or at a at the family kitchen table or the board table or in a council or parliament, how do we use power? Do we monopolize power? Do we brokerage power? Do we avoid and take our power away? Do we give our power up or do we share power? And that's what we're gonna look at. So in terms of the second P of politics, um, there's this continuum of community engagement, which really shows that uh, we go from governments or other powerful power holders that can just be very autocratic and inform us of what's happening. We can be consulted where we get to share what we think, but maybe we're not really involved in the decision making. We are we can share what we think, but the decision makers go off and do what they want anyway. Or we can move to that collaboration where we actually have a role in making the decision and it's a more participatory process. So my suggestion is that we need to move away from consulting to very collaborative ways of engaging and making decisions. And I've created a tool that I'm gonna show you that's gonna be a real scary slide. This is my theories of social change continuum, which is on my website, but it, it goes from very high confrontation, civil disobedience, direct action like strikes to more moderate con uh, con um, confrontation to like lobbying and doing protests, having petitions, doing advocacy for policy. And what I'm advocating is that we actually move to what I call po process advocacy, where we are um, trying to change the process for how we engage and then to go to this final collaborative governance, which I'm proposing is a new theory of change where at the bottom on the purple, you can see we're going to be sitting at the table rather than banging on the door or trying to bang the door down with um, some of those more confrontational methods. Um, oops, I meant to go to the next slide. So the politics of unity and power styles is to explore your orientation to power, how you define and use power. And I took Marianne. this from, yes? Uh, your screen isn't showing. Oh, I'm not. So, oops, oops, I forgot to go back to the share. That's okay. Oh, one second. <laughs> I have to escape from there. That's what I hit the wrong. Here we go. So you saw this, right? Um, this this chart. This is sure. on. This is my continuum of of uh, theories of change going from high confrontation to high collaboration. And then on the far right is more people that aren't engaging with power holders. So doing community development, working in political parties to replace power holders. And then um, now we're talking about this, 
this notion of power styles that we develop a, an orientation and a way of using power that is kind of based on that model of aggressive, assertive, um, you know, passive aggressive, passive and submissive. So um, I've taken this from Thomas Kilman. This is a, a conflict resolution tool that shows how collaboration is situated. So on the on the vertical axis of this chart is our commitment to goals that we can have very high commitment to goals. But if we have low commitment to the relationships that we're in with people, that we're going to be competing. We want our goals. We want our way. And if we have very low commitment to both goals, we just avoid. We're, we're disengaged. And compromise is actually, that's the deal-making place. But collaboration is where we have very high uh, commitment to shared goals, but also very high commitment to having healthy relationships and maintaining good good relations. So what I've done is I've taken this out of the realm of talking about communication and I've said, well, how does this relate to power? And I see someone's got their hand up, but I'll, so I'll, I'll, I'll finish this part and then I can, I can take that question. So um, what I've suggested is that there are these five power styles that, that people are going to be more likely to monopolize power, to avoid and just, you know, leave the meeting. They're going to be the brokerage, the power brokers who make deals and trade favors. And um, and then there's people that abdic abdicate their power. So they often align themselves with power monopolizers or power brokers. And then there's people who are going to be power sharers, people that really want to be inclusive and um, allow people to not just uh, have a voice, but actually have a hand in making decisions and, and looking at their interests. So this is what this tool looks like in more detail um, that we could talk about, you know, how we can move between these different um, styles of how we use power in different contexts at different times, depending on how angry we are, on how much we feel like we have at stake, we can be more inclined um, but I would suggest that there are some people who have never experienced an equitable relationship where they can be safe to share power. So they're inclined to be um, more in one of those other areas. So I'll stop the share again for a minute and I can take uh, hear Paul's question. Or did you um, want to save the question? Was it, or was it pertaining to something specific that I've presented? Well, just with something specific you presented, Marianne, and I'll be really quick. Like, I love the whole, first of all, your presentation is amazing. Thank you so much. It's like dead on to where like we are with what we're trying to do at our, from a nursing education institution. Yep. And we are engaged in a whistleblowing situation because we've had so okay. much. Can you just ask your yeah. question? Okay. Uh, my question is this. How do you move people that are power monopolizers if all you face is the shut door? Like, I guess I'm under, I'm, I'm trying yeah. to figure out how you mobilize that. That's the question. And it, yeah. it is, I call it speaking peace to power. So how do you approach those people using all the tools and understanding that we have about conflict resolution and how people who are power hoarders that they want and command and control kind of folks, how they um, understanding how they see the situation, right? So it's perspective taking. I need to be able to understand things from their perspective. Maybe I don't agree with it, but I need to understand it. If I have any hope of meeting them where they're going to be open to listening to other alternatives. So is that that's the quick answer, I guess. <laughs> I'll, I'll continue on. So the next few slides are just to say that we know a lot about conflict. We know a lot about how conflict escalates, how to de-escalate conflict, how conflict goes from being about the problem to being about people, punishing the people. And this is a model from conflict resolution. There are lots of other models. Um, this is another one that kind of distinguishes between power struggle and conflict. And then this is the brilliant scholar, Johan Goltang, his model for conflict resolution. 
So my point in showing you these slides is to say, we know a lot about conflict and power struggle. We know how to make people feel safe and open to talking in a collaborative way. What we need to do is apply this to our governance and our political structures and procedures. So that's that's what I wanted to, to start off with. So I'm gonna stop the share to see if there are any other clarifying questions. And um, we're doing good on time. So uh, any, any questions or comments about what I've presented so far, besides about applying this in nursing education, which is super fantastic. Should I just keep going? Norm's giving me a thumbs up. Hi, Norm. Um, okay, I'll keep going because I, I do have another opportunity at the end for more discussion. And um, so hopefully it's not, you know, I'm putting a lot in in a short amount of time. So then, you know, we could discuss, Do you does this ring true for you? Does this make sense? Do you think that we can become more adept and committed to sharing power? And can we build that into our political structures and uh, procedures and processes for collaborative governance? So now we're gonna shift to talking about that. How do we change organizational political culture? How do we ensure that conflict stays as a problem at the problem solving level and does not become a power struggle? How do we prevent people that raise problems from becoming the problem? How do we create cultures of personal safety yet bravery and, and courage so that authority and ideas can be questioned? And how do we have free speech without hate speech? That's the big thing. So this is just, you know, a lot of people are insisting that they should be able to say whatever they want about what, whatever they want and don't appreciate that there's a difference between hate speech and free speech. And of course there is, that we can confine um, the expression of ideas that are um, hateful, intolerant, oppressive, discriminatory, and encourage violence and and um, discrimination against other groups. And I think that's part of what's led to this whole idea of cancel culture, where you know activists had attempt to stop bigotry and abuse being spread by preventing certain speakers at universities by can't, trying to cancel venues. That's how this all started, but it's really expanded now into you know, the way that social media is playing a role of polarizing. You, know, you get into your little echo chamber and that it's given people permission to act in a way online that they would never, if they were face-to-face -face looking at someone you know, across a table. And we, we're now also dealing with this notion of complaint culture, which is growing out of this misuse of the protective measures, the very codes of conduct, the human rights um, procedures. They're actually being abused to have complaints filed in a vexatious, retaliatory, you know, harmful way. So people are filing complaints about people um, rather than just discussing issues. So a lot of complaints that I've seen could be resolved with a conversation, but because the complaint process gives the option for people to go to a full investigation, um, it's being used to inflict harm. And it going through the process takes a lot of time and it causes a lot of stress. And it that process of going through is being weaponized um, and it's damaging people's reputation and it's not focusing on changing and healthy relationships. So weaponizing procedure through this complaint culture is for, forcing people out of their jobs, out of their careers. And, you know, we I'm going to tell you a short story of what's been happening in Manitoba. There's a woman that just won. She, we just found out last Friday she won her court case. She's a young professional woman who got elected to a municipal councillor in Thompson, Manitoba. She had been a school trustee. So she's working full time. Her council job pays her $12,000 a year. So not something you could live on. Most of the other people on the council are older men who have either retired or are self-employed. So she has a 
full-time job. They changed the time of the council meetings for a committee to when she couldn't go. And when she missed three meetings, they passed a motion, removed her from her seat, cut off her email, and said that she had been removed from council. Under the Municipal Act in Manitoba, there's a provision that you can be removed from your seat, but she had to go to court to retain her seat. So she just won her case and the judge saw through what was happening. One of the, the municipal council colleagues actually said to the media, she wasn't a good fit. So it became clear that this was intentional and it's such a glaring example of weaponization of procedure that I thought I would use this in the slideshow, but I'm sure you all have examples of this. So what are the solutions to complaint culture and this weaponization of procedure? Um, I think it's applying these principles of the politics of unity and creating more collaborative ways to um, address complaints and misconduct and you know um, abusive behavior or harassment in workplaces. Um, I have a labor background, so I, I sort of think we have to keep things on the shop floor and not go to that grievance complaint level that there are things that can be done in the workplace to address it. Um, we need to create terms of reference for relationships that we, so we agree not to resort to these unfair tactics. And, you know, there are lots of um, uh, examples. There's a website I really love called the uh, Schools of Thought that does a really good job of explaining uh, thought distortions and um, unconscious bias that we use all these tactics when we're trying to get our way or make our case. And we, we can agree to collaborate and we can build um, tools to do that. So be developing methods that are more participatory. I also think it's really important that we understand what I call the psychology of hate, that there are certain people that only feel safe when they, when they are, feel like they're dominant. And that there is this war mindset that the best defense is a good offense, that violent retaliation is justified, and that we need to meet force with force. And this sort of is being applied in, in our organizations, in our workplaces. So we need to evolve our definition of de democracy, that it's more than voting every few years, that it's more about engagement and participation, and that voting actually polarizes people and creates insiders and outsiders, you know, leaders and, and people that are excluded. And um, that we can have more fair procedures to build a more accountable and transparent governance model. So we can apply this to whistleblowing. The politics of unity and addressing complaint culture is like going upstream on whistleblowing. So why are people whistleblowing? Because there's bad governance. So if we can have better governance that's less combative, uh, that we can have um, a more ethical way of preventing uh, the need for whistleblowing. And then we can also improve whistleblower protection using some of these as well, um, that we still need to have whistleblower protection. But I'm I'm suggesting we also have to focus on going upstream and addressing the uh, structures of management of governance and political processes. So we are changing culture. We can speak to peace to power. We can be less reactive. We can move beyond that fight, flight, or freeze and we can become upstanders and not bystanders. So that's, yeah, that's my last slide. Um, we still have some time for some questions, conversation. Hopefully I didn't go that, through that too fast, um, but you know, it, these are complex issues and I always talk about how we have to embrace the complexity of how um, there is political psychology. Like we do have to understand what people bring in terms of their internalized world to the work in the in the world. So um, please ask questions. Jennifer, go ahead. Yeah, I'll kick off the questions. I've got a sort of a double barreled question for you um, in this like fascinating um, and inspiring idea that we, we don't have to be locked into the way we've always done things. There's there are better models can evolve. I love that whole idea. And I think you've laid out a really, just such a positive um, shift into what we need going forward. Um, one of the things that I think about a lot is I worry about 
how we define hate speech as targeting particular groups. And I know this is starting to be a big issue in the workplace in terms of uh, bullying. Um, so if you are a particular group that's designated as vulnerable in some way, then you get protection, but regular people who don't have that vulnerability do not. And this is this gives great power to people who are abusive. And I was thinking that Donald Trump's lawsuit with E. Jean Carroll was particularly interesting because you know, she doesn't have anything that, that necessarily protects her, but the American jurors felt very strongly that although she's not a, you know, doesn't, you know, she's not a visible minority, she's not um, on the spectrum in terms of gender, et cetera, et cetera, she still deserved protection from his hate. And so- She's and a woman. Well, yeah, but I mean, if she was a man, would she not get that? Like, that's where my concern lies. I think we need to expand you know, yeah. hate speech against anyone for any reason is unacceptable. And it, it just has to be that bottom line right there. And I know that's a bit tricky. So I was curious what you would say about that. Yeah. So uh, a woman that's been really influence, influence on me and my thinking about this is um, an American psychologist named Anne Wilson Schrafe, who is Polish and Cheyenne. Interesting, and she's a she's a psychologist, but very active as a political activist, I would say as well. And she has a concept of being peer because this has to do with rank and how people try and um, assert themselves as superior using all these different tactics, right? So the other thing is that sometimes, and I think you've covered this in your work on the bullied brain, which I really appreciated, is that sometimes the people that get targeted are people that are working outside the box. So I can't tell you how many times in my career I've been told by um, someone older than me, um, especially, you know, when I'm, or, or a male, an older male, that I'm making them look bad because I'm doing things in a different way. When I was teaching, I was engaging students in really fun ways. Um, and, you know, universities maybe not supposed to be that fun. So things that we do that we're, where we are sort of working outside the box or thinking outside the box can make us a target because it's threatening the status quo. The status quo. So that's that's one other way of looking at it. Yeah, no, and it's I think it's very topical right now in the world. So it's a really important. Um, are there other questions? Do people want to put up their hand to, to jump in? Pamela? Go ahead, Pamela. Oh, you're muted, Pamela. Yeah, I just, it's more of a comment. I, I found myself reacting when you said people were um, <clears throat> uh, targeted, you know, for thinking outside the box. And in my experience, <laughs> Your target is sometimes just for thinking, Marianne. <laughs> yes. Not necessarily thinking outside the box. And, yeah. Uh, and the, the, the other thing, um, you know, you talked about governance and so on. <clears throat> and, you know, leaders have a huge impact on culture. However, we should not minimize the fact that the people they're leading also have a huge impact on culture. And, you know, you touched on some of it when, when you talked about, um, you know, uh, conflict uh, and communication, conflict resolution and so on. So you don't have to follow. I mean, it's difficult to change, but I think you have to change yourself a little bit uh, and acknowledge and understand that you can uh, resist unwanted forces that when in groups, um, you know, you feel that you must, uh, for example, um, uh, conform, right? And do what everybody else is doing or obey. Uh, and and yeah. part and parcel uh, of, of resisting that is becoming more self-aware uh, you know, understanding our basic instincts, you know, when we feel threatened of, you know, fighting or, 
destroying the messenger or running away, whatever. But a lot of it is, you know, destroy the messenger. But uh, and in order to be able to do all of these things, sorry, we have to train ourselves. And I think a big part of it is training in communication and conflict resolution, where you learn about all these things, you become yeah. more self-aware, and then you can see what's going on when you're in meetings. You can plan and strategize, right. uh, you know? So anyway, those are some of the things that, yeah. uh, uh, you know, I, I definitely... I definitely agree with the training and conflict resolution skills. And I, the last slide in my PowerPoint that I'll share at the end that has my email in that for people asking about handouts is by Paul Chappelle, who says, uh, peace is not a goal. It's a skill set. Exactly. So that, you know, if we, we want peace, like you're saying, we have to look at our, not just our skills in our head, but that's the trauma informed piece where if we've experienced trauma that has helped define our sense of powerlessness or how we get power. And that that is really at the core of addressing, you know, this tendency to be reactive and retaliatory and to resort to not just physical violence, but the kind of psychological violence and uh, abuse that I've been talking about today. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. So Miriam, in the chat, Barry's asking if it's possible to get some handouts uh, to follow up on after after your talk. Yes, for sure. And um, maybe I'll just share to the screen with my last slide. People are welcome to uh, contact me. Where is it here? Isn't it changing? There we are. So this is how you can get a hold of me. And the resources that I've described are on my website um, and you can download them. And I'd be happy to, um, to follow up. So I, I can mean, put all this, seem, I'll, it was, I'll put all this in the chat. Um, and I have some other tools. I can also share the PowerPoint. I was thinking um, personally, um, it would be, so if we go back to the question her pal you were asking, um, it would be amazing to have Marianne come in as a mediator um, into, into power struggles when there is this kind of people are feeling paranoid, they're feeling like if they share power, they'll lose it, that they can't give any empowerment to others. You know, to have a mediator who's knowledgeable and can take people through exercises where they really work out why they feel so vulnerable and why they can't listen to the other side or or empathically recognize what they need would be amazing. Like, I mean, just even the resources on your website are helpful, but yeah. I mean, if I was having big power struggle, I'd hire you, Marianne. <laughs> Thanks. I am trained at a media as a mediator, and I actually got a certificate in um, conflict resolution from Mediation Services in Man in Winnipeg when I was an MLA in the middle of my term because I was the chair of caucus, and it was crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's so it's so, so important. I see that Cynthia has her hand up. Cynthia, are you okay taking your? Um, are, can you show up on the screen for us? Oh, great! It's so much nicer to see someone. Yes. Hi. Um, so I can't see myself, but uh, oh, there I am. Okay. So uh, I've worked on a lot of campaigns and that sort of stuff. And like having these discussions with voters is a non starter. Like you knock on somebody's door and you talk to them for like 30 seconds and you're out, right? So you can't have these types of chats. So I was like wondering for elected, um, Oh, there's my phone. Sorry. I was wondering for like elected uh, officials, like who's got good legislation to counterbalance this type of institutionalized tendencies that could be put into place in provinces or municipalities? I don't think anywhere has this in legislation, like certainly not in political structures. So, you know, I have a whole presentation I call uh, democracy between elections but so there's I don't I think that's the social innovation we are innovating this now because we have to but in terms of you know I've knocked on a lot of doors in my day 
the the door knocking has turned into just voter identification yeah. you know and that's that's part of the campaign model but there is something called deep canvassing which i would invest you know you you can investigate so um you know to have politics be actually about discussing and trying to have people shift their thinking is almost you know not a thing anymore and i've said in in my own conversations like when do when do people get politicized when do they develop a political analysis based on their own lived experience that's what i was trying to teach when i was you know developing this model this three model i've got a whole activity of how to get people to understand the difference between political worldviews so you know i think you're asking a really good question about how do we make uh, those conversations at the doorstep meaningful and um, you know political parties have to decide are they just interested in identifying enough votes to win the election or do you know we want to actually challenge people to think about what they're voting for <laughs> you know so um, and I think yeah Norm has his hand up for a question and Karen would like to Thank ask you. a question after Norm Good to see you guys again. You're muted. It jumped. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so, since we talked to you last, we've been to court two more times. Uh, uh, and they turned out well for us, but now they've sued some other people instead. So uh, anyway, we've been working on something quite close to what you're proposing here today. And I think we agree pretty much with everything, you, what you've said. Now, what you're suggesting is really big change like it's a major change to what we're experiencing now. What we've learned and what we're doing in the last election in Canada, there were just over 27 million eligible voters, but only about 17 million of them voted. So what that's telling us is that you've got a market of 10 million people that are not being served. How do we reach them? How, how, do, we, how do we find a way to talk to those 10 million people who are sitting there voting for no one, who seem to want change and, and are not even interested in the current system anymore. So do you have, yeah. uh, do you have sort of have a marketing idea in mind how that might be approached or is that something you're you're working on? Just because yeah, I, we, think it's, you know, it's, I wouldn't mind collaborating. I think it's political you. engagement. I, I think it's good old political engagement and, you know, going into people's communities and having conversations, um, not just sending emails or having stuff on Facebook, but people need to have, even, you know, it doesn't have to be in person. I think Zoom is actually a really good vehicle. Use it a lot to try and access people in Northern and rural areas in, in you know, I'm in Manitoba. So I think it's, uh, but I th think we have to, uh, like I've taught courses on, when I was teaching at Red River College, I was teaching a course called Facilitating Empowering Process. Like, that's what we need to be able to do, is how do we create engagement in discussions? So even just in this, making sure there's time for people to have uh, a conversation. And well, uh, that would be one thing. Uh, because I think that what we can say is that through our years of battling with the government of Saskatchewan, that all we have run into is the wall and right. the weaponization of process. Yeah, and I, I I know that of you. And and I think, though, when we're talking about political engagement, politics has become very transactional, where it's like, I'm going to give you this promise, you give me your vote. And it's not really about values. It's not about the kind of world we want. It's this transactional trade-off, and that's really been dangerous. And we're not going to get to addressing the significant challenges we face with inequity and climate change and crime, all the other things. So people have to develop a political analysis, and they can't, you know, there's a wonderful quote by Marshall McLuhan, is there's, there's no passengers on planet Earth. We're all crew. Like, we all <laughs> have to have the view that democracy is about everyone being engaged. But I don't know that, you know, what they've done in Australia is, you know, if you don't vote, there's a fine. That's that's one approach. But I think people do care. 
I feel like people are just fed up with electoral politics. It's becoming irrelevant to their lives because it's hyper-partisan, it's polarized, it's petty, and it's not dealing with the real issues that are, are yeah. we're facing. Thank um, you. Karen has a question. Karen, I'm not sure you can show up on the screen for it, but if you could, that'd be lovely. Oh, there she is. You should You're have to take your mute. There she goes. Thank you for the presentation. I'm really looking forward to going to your website and looking more. And uh, as you mentioned, hopefully the PowerPoints can get passed around as well. Um, I was curious, especially about power struggle versus conflict. Um, I find, especially as a, a woman, if you're having conflict, especially with anyone else, it's often described, even though it's about the power struggle issue, it gets whitewashed as it must be a conflict issue. How do you, when you know it's about a power struggle, how do you get that vocalized and, and recognized as part of an institutional power struggle versus having it called an individual conflict. And um, only just because you mentioned about working uh, in Manitoba, I'm also curious if any of this work has been done um, together in discussions with elders or an Indigenous lens, because mm -hmm. I find a lot of this to be very similar to community engagement. And if that's another route of how to present this, especially into government through the Indigenous lenses, bring it in that way. I'm just curious if that's been part of your work at all as well. It has. I mean, I've taught, when I was teaching at Red River, I was in the Indigenous education department, teaching community development and community economic development. And I think all of those things were and are being reclaimed as part of Indigenous cultures. Um, you know, that whole idea of the, of the talking or sharing circle where we talk till we agree that notion. Um, so that's kind of the second part of your question. I think definitely um, Indigenous cultures, not just in North America, but the world over, have been better at understanding cooperation and that we're connected, not that we're uh, superior or individuate individuals. Um, to In terms of the first part, in terms of going be from power struggle back to conflict resolution. There's lots out there about de-escalating and being able to um, name the problem. And that, you know, it's very challenging though, once you are being sort of targeted or marginalized, it is very difficult to do that. Um, but, you know, the, I don't know if you've ever heard of Arnold Mandel, or he's like a conflict resolution guru. I would look him up. He's passed away, but his books, he has a book called Sitting in the Fire and another book um, on uh, deep democracy. And both of those are really good resources to try and understand how we get triggered ourselves when we are put in that position where our ideas are just, you know, marginalized or we're excluded. Um, so we have to, so much of this is doing our own self-reflection and inner kind of, you know, I, I talk about really understanding the oppression that we've internalized so that we are able to be in those conflict situations without react being reactive. So, you know, I, I go to a Buddha Dharma center because meditation and yoga are part of my everyday so that I'm reducing my reactivity and you really have to work at it. You know, it's not, I'm, I'm no saint. I'm, I get angry and lose my temper all the time, but I think I'm getting better, you know, at recognizing. Pamela. Yes. Uh, again, in response to uh, Karen and her um, uh, concern about uh, workplace conflict, uh, you know, it, interestingly, around 20 years ago, the federal government set up something, they call it, um, <clears throat> well, the, the, they call it informal conflict management systems, but the original uh, name was integrated conflict management system, and it brought together um, some of the ideas you were talking about, Marianne, uh, uh, 
for example, having a mediator available with this, the conflict management system ha was separate and apart, it was independent from the organization itself. It responded, it, you know, it, it didn't go through the various hierarchical steps that it reported directly to the deputy minister. But what it was, was a, um, an office where people who are in the kind of conflict that Karen was talking about could could go to this independent uh, specialist who was a trained mediator and, uh, you know, ask for help and, you know, go through a conflict analysis kind of thing, develop a plan and so on. And, um, you know, I don't know if they've evaluated how this has worked, but there's still, uh, you know, quite a lot of conflict going on. But part and parcel of it was to, was first of all, an acknowledgement mm -hmm. that these things are, these conflicts are happening, we're human beings, and that we need help sometimes. And that, uh, and a big part of it was training uh, of all employees in conflict mm -hmm. Resolution yeah. skills because sometimes you know you go to a manager with a problem and they say, Well, you got to go talk to the person. Well, you go talk to the person, and that makes it worse because they don't have the skills. You know, you can have the skills, but if they don't have them, um, you know, that's a problem too. Uh, and the other point that I wanted to make was the biggest skill you can possibly learn. Uh, which is part and parcel of de escalation is active listening. And that's uh, a, a big move now uh, in, in um, uh, that's being spearheaded by a, a, an organization called the Center for Public Implac Impact, working with mm -hmm. governments around the world to get closer to the people that they're providing services to, right. actively working collaboratively with them, you know, at the street level and listening and learning. So moving from command and control to listening and learning governance. So yeah. those are there yeah. these things are really good good points. And I think, you know, developing our capacity for systems thinking and systems analysis. So it's not just about the individual so that we're when we're in a situation, we're able to step back and sort of see those dynamics that are happening, and then make a decision of how we can deal with it. But in terms of, you know, in a workplace, when there's something going on, there's all the other these other witnesses, right? And are they going to be bystanders? Or are they going to be able to be helpful in addressing a situation? So it's not all just up to sort of, you know, management, but, you know, again, coming from a labor background, there are shop stewards, there are workplace safety and health committees there in, in workplaces where it's people that are working in that workplace that can also take responsibility. And that's the kind of culture, that participatory collaborative culture in a workplace um, where it's safe and it's brave that people have the ability to step in to be helpful when so things don't escalate. Um, um, so just that's, to jump that's in. the kind of world. Go ahead, Jennifer. Yeah. Sorry. I just wanted to jump in to be mindful of the time. Oh, yeah. um, some people have to leave and we are at the hour. We're a little past. So I just wanted to um, thank you much. so much for such a Wonderful presentation. Everybody is obviously deeply engaged and learned a ton. I certainly learned a lot. Um, but people do not feel like you need to stay if you have to go on to another meeting. Um, and you all know how to reach uh, Marianne. And this will be posted if you want to share this video ultimately with other people, then that can happen too. I have to slip away myself. Um, I just got called into another meeting. Um, so I'm going to exit, but thank you. Thank you, Marianne. It was absolutely fabulous. Lovely to see everybody here. Thanks, thank Jennifer. You. Yeah, I can take a few more questions or if, if there's something people really want to say or ask. And I did put my contact information in the chat.
the last question on that last slide was how do we deal with this weaponization of procedure? So that's kind of the main thing that we were, there's questions about that, comments? Go ahead, Norman. It's uh, Lisa and um, I just want to comment on, I recall the presentation that Jennifer did where she talked about um, in the workplace and how bystanders, bystanders by their lack of participation actually become an addition to the trauma. So I liked mm -hmm. your comment earlier in one of the slides where it says, will you be an upstander or a bystander? Yeah. So and just- It's that. risky. It's risky. Yeah. I, I think those are the skills to develop, you know, and um, yeah, no piece saying, so, oh, it's not my job or it's none of my business or, you know, um, if if you're in an environment where things like that are happening, it's affecting you and it is your business. Yeah. So thank you again, Norm. Um, Marianne, are you familiar with Deborah Gray's book from around 2004 that said never retreat, never explain and never apologize? Title of her book. That's the title. Well, of that's her a Nellie McClung quote. <laughs> Sorry? That's a Nellie McClung quote. That's a Nellie McClung quote. Okay. The well, Deborah Gray used it, but in a different way. You, do you remember who Deborah is? Yeah. Uh, no. She oh, was, she was uh, she was the first Reform Party member elected, oh. and then and then became a bit of a Harper uh, sidekick. But I I I don't know if I would call it an opportunity. Let's just say I I sat beside her once at lunch, and we didn't get along. But um, <laughs> but but the just the the title of the book tells us what we are up against mm. call it on the other side if you like and and this is exactly the form that government has taken in saskatchewan and in a larger degree in alberta right now as well mm. now i don't want to be too optimistic and and i also want to point out that i'm really i'm not a party politic person but in saskatchewan right now for the first time in probably 25 years it looks like the NDP is polling ahead of the SAS party. It's but it's been quite phenomenal. And I'm wondering, is there not some sort of wave forming maybe just naturally in the background here that can be taken advantage of as well? The general public just being so tired. We hear it all the time. Everybody we talk to is like, no, I, I don't even want anything to do with it because it makes no sense and they they hate I, politics and, and the I just vote and, against the incumbent yeah, because and, they didn't do what yeah. they said they were going to do. M most people we've talked to said no. that they're not voting at all because they they're just find that they're always voting against the incumbent. Yeah. So I think there's something else happening that might be able to take advantage of as well. So anyway, I'm done. Thank you again. Um, yeah. How do we create a political movement for this? I mean, I, I and. Um, I'm still a member of the NDP. I was an NDP MLA. And, um, you know, there is a certain ideology of power that you have to uh, subscribe to, to get into power. And I think that, um, you know, Jagmeet Singh, initially, they talked about love and courage, right? That's what this is. <laughs> you know, it's, it, this is, this takes a lot of courage and a lot of compassion for even people like Donald Trump, like understanding I, I used to joke and say, I want to understand what goes on in that guy's brain. Like, but it's also the ability for someone with that amount of wealth who has that background to be able to rise to power in the United States. Like they don't have very good options right now down south for this election. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the gatekeeping in politics is a big problem. And who actually gets to be on the ballot? Um, is a big a big issue that uh, citizens I think need to be concerned about. So I don't know if there's anything else. We're down to ten people. Okay. Um, I, I was just going to say one more thing, Marianne. A long time ago, someone told me about politics that unfortunately the pendulum of politics from left to right is always going fastest when it goes through the middle. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't know if that's the case. Uh, I mean, well, we never stay I, in the middle very long. Seen, 
but we've seen all the parties move to the right, even the yeah. NDP, right? Yeah. If, and that, I'm baffled by how did we go from Tommy Douglas in Saskatchewan to what we have now? <laughs> like that just, right. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, in Manitoba, we just elected the first ever Indigenous premier in Canada. And um, there was a huge negative campaign by the governing party. And what did they focus on? Trans youth and searching the, the landfill for the remains of Indigenous women that were murdered. Like it was appalling. And people didn't didn't go for it, uh, especially in Winnipeg, um, almost every seat in Winnipeg was was not for the previous government so anyway um i think that's probably about it eh pamela yes <laughs> looks like it it's about <clears throat> 10 after one so thank you so much if there are uh, no more questions we shall say au revoir until the next time thank you very much marianne and and uh, all of the participants wow.